Great. Thank you. Uh, so thanks a lot. I will not say your name correctly, Matios. Matios. Um, thank you very much for uh, hosting this and inviting me on. Uh, I'm really excited to get to talk to everyone. Uh, my presentation today is covering a little bit about what MJBots, MJBots Robotic Systems, that's a company I founded uh, about two and a half years ago. And so I'll describe a little bit about myself and then a little bit about what MJBots is doing and show off some of the projects that people are building with our products. And I don't expect the talk to necessarily go that long, maybe only 30 minutes or so. But as was said, if you have any questions, you can, as you're thinking of them, type them into the chat, we'll collate them. And afterwards, I'll answer the written questions. And I think there might be time for discussion after that. So I'll start here. I am Josh Pieper, that is me. I am a passionate engineer. I've worked in robotics for some time now, since 2004, and I've been building hobby robotics for more than 10 years before that, probably since I can't actually remember the first uh, robot that I built, but certainly automation back when I was in grade school. Um, my professional career has spanned uh, several different domains. I started out developing marine systems at Bluefin Robotics. They developed both subsea and uh, some pseudo surface operation vessels that would autonomously navigate the ocean to search for, uh, do surveys. The military used them to identify mines. I mostly worked on commercial applications where they were used to survey for oil and gas pipelines or for exploration work to look for oil and gas deposits. And that was a really exciting uh, place and field to work in. The robotics is actually some of the easiest robotics there are from a software perspective, which was my focus because once you're underwater, for the most part, you treat the entire ocean as an unobstructed 3D volume in which you can operate in with no restraints, which makes things much simpler than other domains. Uh, on the mechanical and electrical side, it is very hard because salt water and electricity, as you may have guessed, aren't the best friends. After Bluefin, I founded Jaybridge Robotics, co-founded Jaybridge Robotics. There, we developed uh, systems for automating heavy industrial vehicles primarily agricultural tractors and quarrying and mining equipment. This video is showing some of the demonstration systems we developed for automating quarrying operations where a, uh, here it was a pseudo or semi-automated system where in a quarry, one truck was manned and then the remainder of the fleet was automated and the other vehicles in the fleet would largely do what the manned vehicle did with some spacing behind. And those automated vehicles would interact with the other manned vehicles on the site appropriately. And so this video shows some autonomous testing we did at a, a customer site where it would, they would, the human operator would load up the truck with a bunch of rock and then it would drive up and dump it off at the crusher where it'd be ground up. Jay's Bridge Robotics was really fun. We had a relatively small team, but we accomplished a lot of things. We built some really cool software and had a lot of systems out driving around largely on the ground, but away from uh, public roadways. So all the things we developed there all operated only on private ground. The next step I took after that, oh, I had one more video here. Um, and so we also worked, as I said, on agricultural tractors. Here's another video of a tractor, which some random passerby happened to capture as it was uh, running in the field. They actually got a, uh, we only really built several, or some evaluation systems, a half dozen or a dozen or so. Um, but they got a fair number of hours of use. And this was just someone who was randomly driving on the road and posted it on YouTube, which is one of my uh, favorite videos to find because they didn't know what they were seeing. And, it's not often that you see a tractor driving around with no one in it. Um, after Jaybridge, 
I worked at Toyota Research Institute on their unmanned or their self-driving car program. And so this is a video of one of the cars that I worked on at the time it was called Platform 2. Uh, it, it similar to most of the other major automakers, uh, autonomous vehicle programs, it has a whole suite of sensors and it tend to operate on public roadways. Although at the time when I was there, Toyota was still had test drivers in the cars at all times when they were on the roads. And they are largely worked on, they led the team that developed the um, common software across all the research divisions. Uh, that was pretty cool to get to work in a large company for a change, which I hadn't done. And also cool to see what you can accomplish with a lot of investment because Toyota was putting a lot of uh, uh, funding and uh, resources into the program in order to achieve really great results. And the team at Toyota Research Institute was awesome, both in the driving program and in the other programs, largely the, the robotics program there, which was separate from the driving program. There are some great hay bale drops, which was one of the fun parts. And for the last two and a half years, I've been working on MJ bots, which is an attempt to make capable robotic systems that are within that are open source and in reach of uh, both enthusiasts and researchers without needing a Boston Dynamics level budget. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail of that here once uh, Google Sheets lets me switch to the next slide because it doesn't work when it's full screen. Um, and so our goal at MJBots is to allow researchers and enthusiasts to make incredible systems while still having you know, top quality support and affordable products. And to do that, one of the ways which we think that that is possible and enabling is to do through open source, which is something that if you, for most commercial robotic systems, it's not the case that you can achieve both capable and open source, you usually get one or the other. And so for MJBots, all of our software and uh, boards are open source, not necessarily because you want to change them, maybe you do and you're certainly able to but also so that you can understand how they work and their limitations and how to extend them to accomplish the next great thing which you want to do which might not be possible if you didn't have that level of access i'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the different products that mjbots has there aren't that many so it won't take that long um, but that will discuss say a little bit about what we're doing. And so the categories we have are to um, encompass the set of things you would need from a electrical perspective to build a capable dynamic robot system. And so that includes brushless motor controllers, CAN-FD adapters, power conditioning, servo drives, basically anything you would need to build a performant quadrupede, quadruped or bipedal robot if you want to experiment with locomotion. And as it turns out, for a wide range of other motion control applications where you care about either precise positioning, high bandwidth torque control, or experimenting with uh, new novel control algorithms. Um, the first one I've got is the first one we developed, which is the Modius brushless motor controller. You probably have seen similar things. This has, if you make a capability checklist, this is very similar to the controller operating in the MIT Mini Cheetah in that it drives three phrase brushless motors with an integrated encoder. Um, but uh, over the MIT Mini Cheetah, it has many improvements. It has a faster processor, a higher current, higher voltage, faster data rate. It can integrate with. Uh, secondary encoders and importantly it has a support ecosystem so that includes both tools to drive it GUIs to operate it support channels where you can get answers to your questions and maintained software that you can is continually evolving with new features uh, we have a wide a large community of people who are using this for all sorts of applications ones i would not have ever imagined i was just talking to someone today who was using it in a very precise torque control application for 
non brute force safe cracking, which I had not even imagined was something that could be attempted, but it is a, a great fit for that and exciting to see it be used. Um, and I have just a, this is a video showing the user interface that it supports. There are a lot of videos of all of these products, the controller, especially in the ones that are most popularly used on YouTube that demonstrate the new features, show how to use them, and uh, get you excited about what types of projects and capabilities you would want to try. Next is the Pi 3 hat. This is a CAN FD adapter that has five independent high rate CAN channels that attach to a Raspberry Pi. For instance, on for like a quadruped robot, quadruped robot, you might use one channel per leg, which is a good way to achieve high update rate to many servos at once. But you can also use it with for any CAN application. It doesn't have to be with MJBOT's products. It also has an IMU with integrated uh, common filter on the processor and can, can bring down uh, battery voltage so it can power the Raspberry Pi and all the things on the, the Pi 3 hat. And it supports all the same ranges, voltage range and everything else. Um, the form factor is such that it can fit. This is show, it's showing fit inside of the Quad A1 quadruped robot. So it's small, but still lets you do all that high rate control. You can talk to uh, 12 servos at over a kilohertz with this hardware. Um, next is the, apparently my video didn't work for this. Um, I have, there's a power distribution board, which does soft pre-charging for lots of high capacitance loads. And so if you have a machine with 12 servo drives and you put a switch between your battery and all those servo drives, you'll find that your switch fails very rapidly because it sparks every time you turn on and have to charge up all those capacitors. So this is a solution that lets you uh, gently charge those up as well as uh, control from software and monitor the energy and so you know how much power you're using and what voltage the battery is at and so on. Next, I have the QDD100, which is the integrated servo drive. This is what is used in the walking uh, quadruped robot. It has similar specifications to the MIT actuator, but has all the benefits of the Modius controller. So it has a higher maximum voltage, a higher maximum speed, faster communication rate. It's slightly lower weight as well. Um, and it's designed to directly support loads from its output. So it has uh, all the bearings inside so that you can put large cantilever loads like a whole robot leg and not need additional mechanical support, which can simplify uh, rapid robot designs. You don't have to spend as nearly as much time designing the robot as you can just bolting together a bunch of servos with minimal bracketry. And this is showing a quick demo of a telepresence video that I put on YouTube where the two servos were linked purely in software with a Raspberry Pi 3 hat um, operating at two kilohertz. And in that setup, they felt basically like they were linked together by a zero backlash chain, except that you could do things, magic software things like have one require one tenth the force of the other despite having uh, the same range of motion. So you could gently tap one down and that ball was a uh, half kilo juggling ball and it would be able to toss the ball in the air if you just tap the other one, which is something that you couldn't do with a, a chain very easily. Lastly, on the product side is the Quad A1. We have a surprising number of beta testers of this for it not being publicly listed for sale. Um, this is the robot that's in all the YouTube videos. It's similar to the mini cheetah, except that it's all 3D printed, so you can modify it in a low cost fashion with just a consumer grade desktop 3D printer, which is something you can't do with basically any of the other quadrupeds. Um, there are, it's fully programmable over an ethernet link, so you can control it via a JSON to command it and monitor the state of all the, of the position. And 
It can go, it's certainly the fastest open source quadruped robot you can find with a maximum speed of two and a half meters a second, but it's also capable of going over a relatively rugged terrain. It's not up to spot level or Unitree's A1 level of operating on rugged terrain yet, but uh, it's making rapid progress. Um, and so this is, I have some video showing it walking around uh, MIT campus, which is just down the street from me um, and the Boston skyline. So it's able to go over grass um, at moderate speeds. It can also go over rough terrain, like loose rocks and gravel. I think I've got more of those videos here, this YouTube videos even extremely low resolution for me. But if you wanted to see this, you can watch the high res versions on YouTube um, rather than watching the twice compressed ones coming over Zoom. But they're there, they're there nonetheless. Um, I don't remember what else I had coming after this in this video. This might be about it. Yeah. So I'm going to try to switch to the next slide. There we go. Um, and so this is it showing that robot going over some uh, rougher terrain with bumps and uh, um, like that's a tree root. It's not that, certainly if Spot is able to go over much worse than that, but it's still relatively capable for the types of um, terrain. So this is it running over loose gravel. Um, and then if I, I dare not try to skip my, YouTube stream, although I really want to. I'm just gonna sit here and watch this because I, I want to skip ahead 15 seconds, but I'm afraid if I do, YouTube will dislike me in more ways than one. Yeah, and so then this is it operating over loose bricks and gravel and it's able to uh, stay upright and stay stable, despite the fact that feet are uh, imprecisely positioned and slipping around. And there are no force feedback sensors on the feet. This is purely using impedance control. So it measures the uh, downward force from the torque feedback on each of the servos, uh, which it's getting at 400 Hertz. And it's able to um, do that without any problems. Now, if I get to the next slide. And then this is a video of it moving at maximum speed. So it has a few shots at real time and then it in slow motion. So that's at two meters a second, which is a, a, a moderate jog. And then it works up to the maximum speed of two and a half meters per second, which is a pretty decent uh, jog or run for a person. Um, and pretty impressive for something that is only uh, 30 centimeters off the ground which is all the, the quad A1 is, is 30 centimeters off the ground. And weighs 10 kilos. Okay, I skipped that slide. Yeah. And so with most of our products, we, we want you to get things and build great creations out of the gate. And so both the controller and the servo drive come with getting started kits which have everything you need to, you can open up the box and be uh, doing motion plan and motion control within five minutes of opening up the box. So there's no need to build cables or find extra parts or uh, watch extend. The YouTube video from opening up the box to go for each of these is five minutes long. Um, for the software and support, both Modius and QD100, they use since it just has a, the QDD 100 just has a Modius inside, they use the same protocols and libraries. There are Python libraries and C++ for both. The TView diagnostic lets you interactively modify the configuration as well as plot values and inspect the devices through their diagnostic text protocols. And so that's pretty valuable. It lets you make quick progress before you have custom tooling. Um, all of these projects have a distinct GitHub repository, which I think was meant to be on the slide and isn't there. But if you just go to github.com slash mjbots, you'll find all of them. And so those, all the source of those is open source under the Apache 2 license. We have a Discord community, 
with uh, usually over 100 members um, present at one time. And so there you can get 24 seven support for questions and answers. And if you have something you want to get, uh, you're not sure how to make work, we can usually turn around a demo application in a couple of days. Um, this is my uh, world plot. We have customers on five continents, uh, accepting Africa and Antarctica currently, um, mostly in Europe and North America and uh, China and Korea, but uh, in Japan. But so there's people from all over in all time zones uh, using these systems and building amazing things. And so the last part of my presentation are showing off some of the projects which people have posted about publicly. For every public project, there are five who haven't made a web page or 10 or more. Um, so this is uh, um, Artista Automatic on Instagram and uh, Patreon. He's building a low cost quadruped uh, based purely off capstan gearing. And so this has no steel gears, no reducers, no machining required, just all cable driven systems. Um, this is one that I made of a uh, wire cutter and stripper, which just has two Modis controllers, which can cut and strip wires at very high speed. Turns out I was making a lot of cable harnesses and got tired of stripping that much wire. Um, and so it's able to, with not much work, was able to cut and strip wires very quick and effectively. Um, here is a different quadruped based off of QDD 100s um, that has a very different form factor um, and that it's much taller and larger. And that one's still having its control software worked out. Um, I'm gonna like this. I did not mean to have that one on mute. Um, and so we've had uh, Scientific from YouTube. He has done a number of projects with Modi's controllers now, including this, he used it for this 3D printed actuator and did a review of the setup and unboxing sequence. Um, his actuators are some of the better 3D printed ones I've seen. It's challenging to make a 3D printed actuator, but um, plenty of people are trying and some are having more success than others. Um, let's see if I can skip to the next slide. Oh. And that was the extent of my prepared presentation, as I said, around 25 minutes on the dot. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Stop. Great. And then I I it was on. very good. Um, uh, so we will start a Q and A, and for that I will allow everybody to unmute themselves. Um, this Q and A session is recorded, so if you want don't want to be recorded talking for any reason or with your camera, then feel free to type the questions uh, into the chat, and I will uh, read them. Um, yeah, so you can unmute yourself now if you if you wish. So, hey, uh, quick question: how, how many people work uh, at MJ Bots? Is it just it's a one man show, or? Um... Yep, it is just one person full time right now. There are a number of people who are uh, who contribute from time to time through the open source mechanisms, but for full time, it's just me. Oh, cool. Thanks. Hey Josh, I love your product. Uh, I was wondering, as someone that that builds uh, autonomous systems right now with a with a group of people, um, we tend to use a lot of stepper motors. I understand that that's the convention right now, just because of complexity uh, and and price. As BLDC controllers get cheaper, what part of automation do you think that will push steppers to? Well, steppers as, will always have a place. The uh, primary advantages of BLDC-based actuators are their both higher speed, because for like Modius, it requires uh, position feedback. That's not strictly required from all brushless motor controllers, but having position feedback means you don't have to worry about skip steps, which is something that most stepper-based systems very few stepper-based systems also have encoders because it's the encoder is often as expensive as the uh, the stepper. But the, the the place brushless motors have a big win for is when you need to have an encoder, when you want to have 
uh, high speeds or high torques, or if, even if you want to have optimized power consumption. Most error-based systems use the same amount of power no matter what motion profile they're going through because you have to put that holding torque there so they don't skip a step. Whereas with brushless motors or other things with encoders, the power that's uh, applied is largely based on how much torque is actually being exerted and how much mechanical power is being output. So something where you want to move quickly and have forced transparency is a great application for brushless motors or if you just need very precise movements, which can be hard to do with stepper motors as well, if you want to, then you can micro step them and get further. It's an, I'm just amazed at what can be accomplished with stepper motors when I see like my Prusa 3D printers move with my near micron level precision. But to some degree, there's only so fast they can go before they skip steps and they burn the same amount of 50 watts all the time, whether or not they're moving or sitting still. Thanks. No problem, Cameron. Uh, we have a question uh, in the chat from Rafael, and he says, uh, did you found MJ bots because of the progress you made with your quadruped, or did you first found MJ bots and then build the quadruped as an example application? I think the answer to that is a little bit of both. Uh, my goal with MJBots is largely to build things that enable people to uh, create amazing machines that uh, do world or novel and new uh, behaviors. Um, as part of that, I had always wanted to make the. Uh, quadruped like machine and actually there are more in the work more other types of machines in the works so it's certainly a part of it is as a demonstration of the technology but it's also as a product itself we i have a, a half dozen people who are using beta quality ones now for various applications from uh, testing locomotion algorithms to um, that verifying higher level autonomy behaviors and to some degree we want to make all the things you need to be successful. Having at least one example application means it's pretty likely the underlying things work. So if you see the Quadi one running around, you know that the Modi's controllers and the QDD 100 are all capable of working because you can see them work in a large level machine. And we have confidence in that they work in a large level machine with the performance that you need. Um, then we have uh, another question from uh, Gasser. Uh, he's asking, if I am new to the quadruped, what resources would you recommend to study from? That's a great question. Um, it's one, there are a number of resources which are valuable. One, the, the self plug I'll give is the MJBots Discord is home to a large number of people building quadruped and similar dynamic machines. Uh, there's a channel for people to discuss their own projects. There, and that question is asked probably every week on that Discord. And there are a semi-stock reply of a reading list um, in terms of blogs and papers that cover different aspects of that, depending upon if you're interested in the software, the electrical or the mechanical aspects or all three. Um, uh, you can also read, if you look at my personal blog, jpieper.com, um, it has posts that cover the entire process of developing the Quad A1 from start to finish. It's not necessarily a concise reading list, but it is a, uh, has all the things you might like to see. Um, and so I will link the, um, the blog is that if I get a, the right number of slashes and i will do the i'll just put the discord in the chat the, all those things you can also get to from mjbots.com but um, so, and copy link and there's the discord link as well so those are the um those two links. And so those are good resources. You can also um, 
five years ago or six years ago when I started this, Ben Katz, who developed the mini cheetah, his blog had a lot of his initial experimentation, but once MIT decided they're going to patent aspects of it, his uh, contemporaneous communications stopped. Um, but of course, there's also all the research uh, conferences as well, which have lots of academic papers on covering both novel and survey papers that cover the uh, the broad technologies used. But certainly starting in the Discord and asking questions is a great place to go. Perfect. Um, the next question is from Amit. Uh, what is the control software in Quad A1? Did you train it to work? Thank you, that is a great question as well. The, the Quad A1 does not use machine learning in its control algorithm. Um, its, its control software is just a Raspberry Pi 4, which as far as the quadruped platforms go is not necessarily a very uh, powerful performance processor. Um, it's plenty capable, but it's, it's not uh, one that's intended to run deep machine learning models. And so the, uh, Goal, one of the goals I had with the Quad A1 specifically was to push the limits of what could be achieved with uh, tradition, with um, just a PD based, proportional derivative based uh, kinematic control models. And so the Quad A1 has a heuristic based gate generation where the end effectors, so the feet, are controlled in 3D kinematic space with proportional derivative controllers and also the joints are as well. And then there is a uh, set of heuristic gate generations which move where those feet go and what the gains on the controllers need to be at each point in time based on the force feedback that are coming from the actuators. And it's, you've see, seen in the videos here today, the types of behaviors it's capable of. It's not world leading in performance, but it's also plenty capable and can go over a wide range of terrain for having relatively simple control that runs on a very inexpensive processor. I mean, to some degree, it's more just a, a, a point of um, an artificial constraint because the processor is you know, one one thousandth of the cost of the machine um, and it could easily afford to have a more powerful processor. But that was just where I started and it was a good point to say, yes, you can do uh, plenty of impressive things without using a, a very high performance processor. Yeah, it's interesting how we can use uh, such a, yeah, not so powerful computer. Actually, yeah, I didn't check uh, your uh, quadruped before this talk uh, in detail, so it's quite interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, the Raspberry Pi 4, it has four processors, each of which runs at one and a half gigahertz or something. Um, and the Quad A1's control loop runs only at 400 hertz, which it, it's able to achieve that without problems. But um, it's also not capable of doing even optimization-based control really in, on that computational budget. So it doesn't use MPC, much less uh, deep learning. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, yes, Fant, yes, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but you have raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, hi, Josh. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, I have a short question regarding your previous experience, uh, not from the like on the hardware side, but quite but on the software side that you worked with the Bluefin Robotics uh, in your past, uh, working with this uh, underwater robotic systems. Can you share some more your experience about that, like uh, the applicative demand and what were the like major problems that you faced in this period or so? Sure. Um, and uh, so your question was to share some of the major problems and yeah. some of the techniques used. Was that your question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for the the underwater machines, the, the serving ones, as, as I mentioned when I was talking to begin with, Bluefin, most of their machines were open ocean machines which meant you put them in the water and aside from the bottom, they assumed that the world was a free 3D space. They could t choose to go anywhere they want to with no risk of collision or entanglement or anything, which mm -hmm. in some sense 
simplified the software a lot uh, because you don't you don't have to have there's no perception required the only perception is how far away is the bottom and as long as you're at least 20 meters away from the bottom you're not going to hit anything so in that sense the software was uh more straightforward but there were this was also 16 years ago when robotic software was not as uh advanced as it is today so even the things we were doing then were state of the art commercially at the time and so because they were underwater and had very limited communication sometimes there was a lot of autonomy that needed to happen um, some of the systems that i worked on would operate at uh, three kilometers up to three kilometers deep which at three kilometers deep it takes it approximately an hour and a half or two hours to get down and the bit rate of communications you have to the machine when it's down that far is not that different from a rover on mars you might get 30 bits per second of information to and from the machine when it's down that far uh, mm -hmm. if you're able to maintain communications at all which you may not be able to do uh, and so a lot of the work there was ensuring that they could accomplish their mission and handle all contingencies largely autonomously and have appropriate safety measures to get back when they uh, um, if problems were detected um, that said even with the i have plenty of uh, anecdotes of times when things did not go as planned which are um you know some some of them are very humorous at one point that three kilometer deep system the operator um who had a doctorate in geophysics was but wasn't the software developer on the project was very hands-on controlling the system and at one point when it was down three kilometers under the ocean floor he wanted to change a parameter that required rebooting the software. And he thought, well, there's a button that lets me reboot it here. I'll, I'll try rebooting it when it's two or three kilometers under the water. What he didn't know was that the, the, nav the navigation solution on the machine, when it first started, until it received a GPS fix, assumed it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, which it did not get a GPS fix when it was three kilometers under the ocean floor. So he rebooted it and then told it to go like 100 meters away from where uh, he was at that point, which was Monterey Bay in California. And it immediately said, well, I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I need to hightail it to California. And before he could do anything, it went at maximum speed due west, and he lost communications with it, and the multi-million dollar machine um, was gone. Although that particular one washed up on the beach in California a month later. Um, so it's not always a, a loss, but though, but in a lot of cases, the uh, um, uh, for those commercial applications, since they were used by people for real jobs, a lot of the software work is filing off all the system level integration issues to make it work 99.5% of the time, despite all the ways that the software can go wrong or that people can go wrong or the hardware can go wrong. And so the actual autonomy you could probably any undergraduate could have imp implemented a version of the autonomy that these systems had in terms of you know there's a list of 10 behaviors and if an abort happens you do one of three possible things depending upon where you are so, mm -hmm. there were more complicated i personally was not involved in this system but bluefin had a system which was a ship hull inspection system which had more sophisticated autonomy because it operated in close proximity to a ship vessel and would uh, maneuver to cut, get full coverage of the exterior of the ship vessel in order to look for uh, wear or, um, I guess, worst case, mines or something stuck to it. But mostly it was to inspect it for uh, cracks or uh, maintenance problems. Um, and so that used a series of imaging sonars to uh, image the side of the ship and then navigate in a, a grid pattern, well, not quite a grid pattern because it had to go around all the other random protrusions that there are on the sides of actual ships, but it would navigate around all of those. That one had the benefit that it was often tethered, um, or if it wasn't tethered, it was at least close enough that there was decent communications bandwidth. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Um, when you had this um, underwater vessels, did you have a some information who to call if you find it on the on the beach. 
Yeah, they all had a big bright label that said if found, call this number. Ah, that's cool. <laughs> and so they, they usually, if they returned it, if they landed in one piece, I think they always got returned. But mm -hmm. in some cases, they didn't return in one piece. Uh, we have a question from Cameron. Uh, do onboard absolute encoders exist? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by on board. So for instance, the Modius brushless controller in, has an integrated absolute encoder. So it has a, a magnetic absolute encoder that's on the back of it. So you can mount the brushless controller right to the rotor of a brushless motor. And that magnetic encoder, you put a diametrically magnetized magnet. So the, the north and south pole are um, uh, perpendicular to the sensor. And it can then measure the angle of the magnet uh, instantaneously in an absolute fashion. And so those types of sensors exist. There are other absolute encoder technologies that exist as well um, that are some of they have different properties. Some are more expensive, but more precise. And some are less expensive and less precise. Uh, or they require different mounting uh, regimes. The absolute, the magnetic encoders are relatively forgiving because you can just stick a magnet almost anywhere on the rotor and put the encoder kind of near it and get something to work, even if it doesn't perform super well. Um, but there are lots of options depending upon your application. They won't all work with Modius, but uh, they can certainly work for other uh, controls. Maybe uh, Cameron can clarify the question. Uh, I would suppose it means that the encoder is sort of embedded in the motor, but I'm not sure. No, my bad. I meant I meant integrated. Integrated is definitely right. Um, just relative versus absolute. Like, do you if you if you flash it, um, shut off power, does it keep position? So the Modius controller has the absolute encoder that can will keep the rotor position uh, if you have a and so that will remember the position within modulo 360 degrees of the rotor if you have a gear if that drives a gearbox there is a provision to put a secondary absolute encoder on the final output and so that it can then remember the final output or you can if you have a gearbox you can run without that and instead either is zero it through other means you, you the zeroing doesn't have to be as accurate because it knows where it is relative to the rotor so instance on the quad a1 it has no absolute encoders after the gearbox it only has them on the rotor and so at power on it only knows the position to within one sixth of a revolution of the output um, but it has a turn on position that is as long as you're within one sixth of a revolution it works out okay um, got it okay you can or you can use that uh, secondary absolute encoder. Okay, uh, we have the next uh, question from uh, Dietrich. What's next? What are the next products and ideas you envision for MJ bots? Well, I will say that for the last four months, a lot of the MJBOT's future product developments has been co-opted by the global semiconductor shortage, which has been an enormous time sink for anyone building electronic devices. Because a lot of the time that was going into building new products has instead been going into redesigning projects to use chips that don't have a 64 week lead time on them, which is surprisingly common for multiple of the boards that MJBOT's builds. A a component which was easily accessible because of the pandemic. It was easily accessible in January and then February, the lead time is 54 weeks for a new, ver new instances of it. Um, but we did just finish a full revision of all the boards to handle the higher current rate or higher voltage range. So now all the MJ bots boards are rated up to 44 volts and they all run at five megabit uh, can for all the ports on everything. Um, and the power distribution board was the most recent new, the current version of that is the most recent new in that it has energy monitoring and does the soft start when you're powering on. So that makes it, uh, it can handle a much wider range of um, power than the old one. So it can drive up to 4,000 microfarads, which is a lot of motor drivers or some really big capacitive loads, as well as telling you how much power to use. For our next, the uh, 
kind of going where people have been using and running into hurdles. So there we have plans for higher power um, versions of different devices, as well as there's a lot of feature work that's happening even within the existing hardware. And so if you look even just this week, uh, one or two features have been announced on YouTube and the blog, and there are three or four more that are coming out for Modius specifically over the next month. And so those, everyone who already has a Modius controller gets those for free with no extra work aside from updating your software. Uh, and I, after seeing uh, the Ascento demonstration from Weekly Robotics three weeks ago, I have a strong desire to try to build an Ascento in a, a weekend from the parts that I have, um, because I think that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you can build a center, that would be great. And then if you sell it, I hope Victor is not watching this. Uh, if you sell <laughs> it, <laughs> or you, you can make it into a race, who bids it first. Um, I think though it's, you need to be, you are entering with, I think like a center, you're really close to real time for the balancing if you need to move nicely, I think, um, but I never did it really. Um, since we're sort of on a tangent topics to that, uh, do, you, um, do you know of anyone using ROS with your controllers or having gross drivers? There are people who have, um, although I'm not sure with what level of success they have to date. Um, mm -hmm. Most, there aren't, for most people who are developing high bandwidth systems, it's not something that you put ROS in the control loop for. And so there's, uh, in the same way that Ascento didn't use ROS, because it's hard to run ROS at 500 hertz or a kilohertz and have mm -hmm. it, the timing work out well. Um, and so a lot of people are, I think, aiming to use the MJBots products with ROS acting as the command and control layer. Um, and I've seen a number of people working to use ROS Pi with the Python Modius bindings as well. And I was just helping someone in Discord with that last week make that work, and I think they were successful. Um, but it is not as full featured of integration as I would like at this point, because even though you you wouldn't use ROS for high, high bandwidth application. A lot of people are using these motor controllers for non-high bandwidth applications because they're still really easy to use. And for that, a ROS integration would be great. And it doesn't exist that well yet. OK. Well, I'll make one at some point then, maybe, if I have time. Um, cool. Um, does anyone have other questions? Um, yes, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, is there any other way to interface uh, with the motor controllers apart from the CAN FD? No, that is part of, well, I don't mean to be flippant. That is part of the, uh, the way that Modius is able to be both small and inexpensive is by limiting the hardware interfaces on board. Certainly, a lot, for a lot of people, an O drive is the appropriate uh, motor controller. I mean, O drive is much bigger and it's more expensive, but it has five different communications interfaces. And so if you need, if you need to be able to design around a specific communication interface, that might be the best option. Um, but it's certainly not, uh, the CAN-FD can be used from a lot of environments without a lot of work. I mean, we provide the Pi 3 hat, but you can also use the FD CAN-USB that MJBOT sells, or even a $20, uh, the $20 Seed Studio CAN FD hat for a Pi, Raspberry Pi or any can is the standard. So any CAN controller can be made, almost any CAN controller can be made to work with it. I did find one that I couldn't make work uh, last month, but for the most part, any CAN. But so no, the, um, the CAN is the only way, although you can use the Python or C++ bindings or do things just from the, the TV console for some applications. I have another question, and it's my favorite one uh, that I try to ask everyone joining this. What's the most mind-blowing issue that you've come across, either uh, in your work with MJBots or in your career? 
Yeah, I, I knew you're going to ask this question. And then I, I used up my answer already on the, uh, the, um, the on, this. on the robot that ran off to the um, and to Japan from California. Um, that wasn't really mind blowing, it was more just funny that it uh, went away. Um, the Certainly, there's no shortage of uh, duh incidents. At this point, from the software side, the, the challenges I run into are largely things that either, yes, they're my mistake, or the vendor didn't document something properly, or it was there. It was just very hard to diagnose because of the, uh, the information feed you had available to you. Um, I have, oh, this is a story that's actually not software. It's not in hardware. It's not even electrical, but it is from when I was uh, working on vessels. And it is one that caused someone else a lot of pain to diagnose in a, a humorous way. Uh, we were operating out of what is called a rigid hull inflatable boat, which is a small dinghy with a motor on it. So it's a, a small rigid, it has a, uh, a solid hull bottom and an inflated rim in the Boston Harbor, tending to an autonomous vehicle, which was doing a test survey of a beach near a water treatment plant. Um, and as we were uh, tending to it, which largely meant just sitting back with our legs up, watching it surface every 10 minutes to check for GPS and then go back down again, engineers have a lot of time sitting around with nothing to do. And we were sitting there with nothing to do, being qualified engineers when uh, a little piece of something floated by in the water next to us. And we went and we looked over. And then as we were looking at it, we saw another and another and another. And soon we saw like maybe a thousand little square things floating in the ocean around us in Boston Harbor. And we picked one up and it said on it, this is an oceanography current scientific research card. If you find this card, please enter its information into this website so that we can better understand oceanographic currents. And apparently someone had released their set of these, uh, must have been a short distance away from where we were testing. And given that we were a bunch of engineers who tested marine systems all over the world, we proceeded to collect about a hundred of them and put them into all of our test cases so that every place we went around the world, even in landlocked lakes, we could chuck a few of the cards into the lake and uh, give someone some additional noise into their experiment, hopefully in a lighthearted way when they saw things that were not physically possible. So that was someone else's mind blowing problem when they uh, found one of these cards released in Boston Harbor in the, the Red Sea and were wondering how it got there. <laughs> that's I'm sure someone had their mind blown or maybe they don't maybe they are still wondering what happened there <laughs> interesting um, um, and maybe about your large actuator module um, what's the minimum speed that you can operate it with is there any? Would it doesn't really have a minimum speed. It can, uh, I mean, it can operate. The minimum speed is probably there is a minimum speed. It's so slow, it probably doesn't isn't relevant. It's on the order of um, it would be measured in one ten thousandth of a hertz, which would be uh, I'm not sure what that is. It's under a milli degree per second or something would be the minimum speed okay. that you can command it at. Um, in practice, the backlash of the system is going to be such that the precision of the motion wouldn't, since this is a gearbox driven actuator, mm -hmm. it has backlash. And so the backlash would be more than the motion at that uh, speed. So if you needed that precise of motion, this actuator might not be the uh, most appropriate one for it. Um, mm -hmm. If you need to move that slow, the maximum speed is fast, it can move up to almost 4,000 degrees per second, which is uh, um, yeah. 20 hertz or so. 
And so the range of speeds at which you can do is, is like four or five orders of magnitude from the okay. fastest to the slowest. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it works on some uh, actuators, but without uh, without gears. And um, the cogging was usually an issue, but yeah. Uh, yeah, and the there is the, the cogging, since this is a closed feedback system, if you're moving that slow, you can compensate for the cogging. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, cogging torque is there still as well. So if you need precise force control, it won't be that precise of control when you're moving that slow either for the torque. Mm -hmm. um, cool. I've also really liked the scientific video with your actuator. It was pretty cool build. Yeah, he does a lot of, um, when he doesn't have the, uh, the unobtainably priced robot arms, a lot of his videos are really awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, um, does anyone has any other questions? Otherwise, I will turn off the recording and then we can continue with some random chat. Oh. Uh, do uh, there's a question from uh, Amit? Uh, do you have any plans for a smaller QDD actuator around sixty to seventy millimeter range? Um, the likely product line expansion for actuators is probably bigger rather than smaller. There are fundamental mechanical limits that make it not really any cheaper to make them smaller. In fact, they'd probably be more expensive to make them smaller. And most people who want a smaller actuator want one because they will, not necessarily because it's lighter weight, but because they want it to be less expensive. But given that it's not possible to, with this type of technology to make it much less expensive, it doesn't seem like the more, most appropriate product line offering where there are lots of people who want to do heavier things and are willing to pay more money for it. And so that's it's certainly possible to make this style of actuator be have four or five times the torque or maybe even more depending upon uh, what you're aiming for um, but for lower cost systems there aren't very many there are really no demonstrated great solutions yet that like the one of the best would be the one that artist automatic damien made with the capstan which you trade off assembly time each actuator takes a dozen hours to build or more for each one, but you don't have to pay for a, a gearbox or machining to make it work. So that's, that was me presupposing why you would want a smaller actuator. I suppose there could be other reasons too, um, but the, the short answer is no, because I can't make one with that would be any cheaper. Okay, cool. Um, so with that answer, I will stop the recording and um yeah we will uh, we'll see what you are up to all the time because i'm subscribed to all your uh, all, all your feeds i suppose <laughs>